Hello everyone. So today we're going to talk about pseudo-random functions. So what's all this about? Remember where we left off last time is that we studied a primitive called a block cipher. We had understood that this is one of the main building blocks for cryptography. It's a low-level tool. It's not directly going to be the way we eventually perform encryption, but it's a crucial component and we need to make sure we have block ciphers that are secure and reliable and fast. So we studied a few examples like DES and AES, and we also studied how we might measure their security. And the way we did that is by saying that the adversary goal is to recover the target key from input-output examples, and how good is the block cipher is a me measure of how hard it is for the adversary to find this key. But then we ended on a kind of more novel or interesting note, which is that that's actually not a sufficient metric for how good a block cipher is, because it's quite easy to design blatantly bad block ciphers, which are very strong under key recovery security. And we now want to ask, stepping back, not the question of how do we design the cipher, but how do we measure or define what is a good block cipher? What is even the criterion or the metric? We had said also that a natural approach is to list desirable properties. One of them is certainly that it's hard to recover the key from input-output examples. Another could be it's hard to recover the message from the ciphertext which may be possible without knowing the key. All of these are good properties, but they're not sufficient because many other things are also desirable. And no such list is going to give us a full and final answer. So um, we turn to looking for somehow a definition under quite a different paradigm. And as an introduction to it, we'll look at something analogous which came up when Alan Turing was asking himself the question that if we want artificial intelligence, but what does it actually mean? What does it mean that a program or robot is intelligent in the sense of human intelligence? Uh, it would be nice to know that before you target designing it. But that's a difficult question to answer. Does it mean that this, this robot or program is capable of emotions? performing certain tasks that we do, like image recognition, mathematical abilities, limitations. It cannot do large computations and numbers terribly fast because we can't. As with the problem we saw earlier, no such list is a really satisfactory answer. But Turing came up with something else that was a different paradigm and quite interesting. What he said is that we'll call a program intelligent if its input-output behavior can't be distinguished from that of a human. So the model here is that you don't actually try to say what intelligence is. You rather say we have an embodiment of it, which is a real person. The extent to which the program mimics human behavior is thus its intelligence. This is turned into a more mathematical or computational even test, which works as follows. We have a target program P. This is the object whose intelligence we are trying to measure. And we have a tester whose job is to determine to what extent the program is intelligence. We create two rooms. In each of them, there's a keyboard and then a wire, and then a wall, and a screen on the keyboard. And the tester can enter questions on the keyboard and get answers from whatever is behind the wall, which is hooked up to provide these answers. In room zero, that other entity is just a human being. In room one, however, these answers are being provided by this program P. Okay, so what the how the game proceeds is we put the tester first in room zero and you let it interact with the object behind the wall. Then you put it in room one and let it interact with the object behind the wall. And then you ask the tester which room was which. 
Now, I maybe didn't say it clearly enough, but obviously the tester doesn't know a priori going in which is room zero and which is room one. It's not like that's written on the door or something. You put it in, in one of the rooms and then in the other, and it doesn't know which was which. So it comes out and you say, well, do you think you, what you were talking to was the person or the program? If our tester is able to correctly identify which room it was in, that tells us that the program is not doing a good job. It's not very human-like. But if the tester comes out and says, look, I really can't tell whether I was talking to a person or a program, then, well, the program is doing what it should. It's imitating a person. Okay, so this is kind of the paradigm we want to use and apply it to create a metric of security for function families, and in particular block ciphers. When we abstract out the, the Turing paradigm, we see that there is some object whose property we're trying to measure. In this case, the object is a program, and the property or notion we're trying to measure is intelligence. And we do that by comparison with what we might call an ideal object, something that we understand has the property, in this case a human. We want to use the same approach for block ciphers. A particular block cipher, AES or DES, is the real object. The metric or notion will give it a name. It's called PRF, standing for pseudorandom function. But what we have to decide is what is the ideal object with which we'll compare this? And the choice we make is what we're going to call a random function. Intuitively, what this will capture is that a good block cipher is one that on any input returns values that to all intents and purposes look just random with the important caveat that you don't have the key under which these outputs are being computed. It may look a little strange, but we'll see it's exactly what we need to do good crypto. Now, this will involve some amount of definitional mathematical development, and it certainly looks pretty abstract. So I was thinking that maybe before we dive into all the math, I might show you how it's not merely something theoretical. Nowadays in practice, the PRF notion of security for block cipher is well accepted. It's used everywhere, and it's expected that people understand what it is and how it works. So this, for example, is a, is a thread in a mail archive of the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is charged with developing certain standards for cryptography. And as you can see here, they're discussing uh, not just PRFs, but whether certain PRF candidates inside TLS have proofs of security. So you can see quite a bit of concern with the types of ideas we're going to talk about. Um, here's another one which, uh, which uh, considers a particular design and asks about its PRF security. Right? So we don't have to worry too much about the details, but it's mainly to tell us how um, PRFs are actually arising in, um, in real life, and you're likely to encounter them in any sort of design situation you might even meet in, in um, industry. Okay, anyway, getting back to the technical content. For a while, forget block ciphers. I want to talk about something called random functions. And they will be defined through games. So we've seen games before. All it is is an API. A game means that I will write code for several procedures, some of which will be exported. And an entity, the adversary, will interact with this API. And then we'll want to ask questions about its output. There's a game called RAND. It's subscripted and thus parameterized by a set. So R here is some finite set. It has only one procedure, and it's called FN. We've seen that name before, but that doesn't mean it works the same way. We can rewrite the procedure as we like in a new API. Give it an input X, and what it does is it simply picks a random point from the set R and returns that okay, at a high level. So it's a very simple and noise box. All it does is if you give it a question, it says, I'm going to ignore your question and just give you a random answer. 
Okay, what is all this T stuff about? This box has one piece of sanity or structure that if you twice ask the same question, it will return both times the same answer. So the table T stores all the answers. When you've asked a query for point X, the table T will remember the answer given the prior time. And if you ask it again, it'll say, okay, I look at the table entry and I find that it's defined. In that case, I'm not going to pick a random value. I'm going to return the old one. This symbol here is called bot. And, it, and the array T starts out everywhere being bot. And as you ask questions X, it gets filled. So these steps fill it. Okay. So our adversary talks to this, this box. That means it gives X's and it gets back these things. Just a bunch of random stuff. And then eventually it halts and it'll have some output. Uh, often a bit, but um, maybe not. We want to look at these outputs, but whatever output occurs is not something that will happen always, but rather with some probability if nothing else, because there's tons of random choices going on here. Take a particular output D. D is often like 1 or 0 or true or false. It will occur with some probability. Right? And so this represents that probability. And the way we write it is here's the game, rand sabar. The superscript of the adversary says this particular adversary interacting with it, what is the probability that interaction results in an output D from the adversary? Okay, so let's play with that with a few examples. Here's a game. This is the same. We have only one game ran, but the parameter now is the set 0, 1, 3, which means the set of all 3-bit strings. So what the procedure does? Well, it just picks 3-bit strings at random and returns them, making sure to memoize, and um, if it's already seen in X, it returns the same thing as before. You could consider a whole slew of adversaries that talk to this API, but I wrote down a very specific one. It calls the function on input 0, 1, gets an answer y, and then it tests if y is the string of all zeros, three zeros, and if so, it returns true, otherwise it returns false. Remember, this brackets around this means treat this as a Boolean expression, return true or false. Okay, what I'm interested in is how likely is it that when you run the game and the adversary, you get back true, that this output is true? And so let's compute that. So what we're asking then is when the adversary queries 0, 1, 0, 1 goes into here. It'll look and see, is this entry equal to bot? Yes, because nothing has ever been queried before. So it'll pick a random 3-bit string in reply and return that. So what we're eventually effectively asking here is, will a random 3-bit string equal 0, 0, 0? How often does that happen? Obviously, uh, with probably 1 and 2 to the power 3. Right? If you pick a random 3-bit string, it has 1 in 8th chance of being 0, 0, 0. And that's it. That's how we compute probabilities in these random games, and that's what they mean. We'll be seeing this a lot, so let's try a couple of more examples just to make sure you're on board. So I don't change the game. I still leave the set to be the set of all three bit strings. But I could consider many adversaries. So here's a second one. This one exploits the ability to make multiple queries. It will call fn first with 0, 0 to get a value y1, then with 1, 1 to get a value y2. And the condition it evaluates is more complex. It wants to know whether y1 is 0, 1, 0, but also y2 is 0, 1, 1. Okay, how do we compute that probability? When we look to see what the y1 would be, when it's queried here, 0, 0 is the value of x. t of x will be bought. It's not been queried before. So a random 3-bit string is chosen and returned. So y1 is a random 3-bit string. What about here? You query 1, 1. x is 1, 1. Now, although t has been populated at 0, 0, it's not been populated at 1, 1. So this will be bought. A random value will be chosen, 3 bits long, and returned. So y2 is a random 3-bit string. 
how likely is it the first string has this value and the second this value? Well, each has a chance one eighth to happen, and the two events are independent, and so you get that it's uh, two to the negative three times two to the negative three. Good. Let's do a final example just to uh, look at a condition that's a little more interesting and also arises rather a lot in our usage. Again, the game is the same and I only changed the adversary and I didn't even actually change its queries. What I changed is what, how does it decide to return true or false? Rather than testing whether these have some values individually, it'll XOR them and test if the result is 101. Going through the same reasoning, y1 and y2 are random 3-bit strings. So what we're asking is if I take two random 3-bit strings, how likely is their XOR to be 101? And so that comes down to a little probability question. If you play around with that, you'll soon see that the answer is 2 to the minus 3. And there's many different ways to see that. The way I often see it is, let's say I've picked y1. No matter what y1 is, there's only one choice for y2, which makes this equation true. And that y2 has this probability of arising. Since that's true for all y1, this is the overall probability. You may have many other ways to see this. OK, so. Um, We've now done the first step in defining peer apps. We've talked about random functions, and we hopefully know what that is. It's just effectively a game. So we proceed to the second part. Now, although our interest, at least for the moment, is largely block ciphers, the definition doesn't require that condition. It works for any family of functions. Recall a family of functions is simply a two-input function f, it takes a key from some space of keys, an input from a domain D, and returns an output in a range R. And recall the notation that when you take a particular key in this space and put it as a subscript, you're considering the map that keeps this key fixed and then maps x to f of k and x. Okay. And really, this will be the object of interest to us. A block cipher is simply a particular case of this. For example, for DES, the key space is this, and the domain and range are this. And in a block cipher, remember by definition, each of these functions is a permutation. But that's not going to be needed for the definition we give. OK. The intuitive idea of what is a pseudorandom function is quite simple. And if you see that, it's much easier to play with it and and evaluate the games that will follow in the formal definition. What it says is that consider the input-output behavior of f when you have fixed the key to a certain particular choice k. That choice k will have been made at random and hidden from you as the tester. All you get to do is give inputs and get outputs. And the property we're interested in is that those inputs and outputs look pretty much the same as what you would get from a random function. In other words, whether you're playing the random game or you're playing the game of giving inputs to this f under k and getting outputs, you would not be able to tell. A key component of making this work is that the tester does not know what this key is. Otherwise, the whole thing is kind of meaningless. Okay, so now we formalize it. And now again, remember that these types of games and formalizations are in many ways the core component of what the class is about and the thing that you really need to understand and will show up in homeworks and quizzes and so forth. So spend time uh, offline also to, to look over these slides and kind of see how things work. So we start with a given family of functions f. That means that it's a publicly specified family. Everyone knows its description, and everyone knows that we're talking about that. And our intent is to measure its security. It could be DES, it could be AES, it could be any number of other things. We will consider for this not one game, but two. Let's look at the one on the right first, because it's familiar. It's just our old friend, the random game. 
with the set from which you're drawing things set to the output set of the family of functions. This game does not actually depend on f beyond that it depends on the set r. The procedure fn takes x and it just returns a random point from this set unless of course it had already been called on x in which case it returns the prior value. Okay, what is the other game? It's called real and it depends on the function f entirely. It starts with an initialized procedure which like what we've seen in the key recovery games picks a random key from this space. Once that key is chosen, it's fixed and frozen for the rest of the game, and it's not given to the adversary. So the adversary calling fn does not see this key. This is the procedure exported. So these two games are effectively exporting the same named procedure fn, but they perform differently. Here the code looks like this, here the code simply evaluates this function under this key on the provided input and returns the answer. If it was AES, it would run AES with this key here and that would come back. Okay, we put our adversary to play these games. If it plays with this game, um, we're interested in whether or not it outputs one. What the adversary is trying to do is distinguish which game it's playing. Its goal is to output 1 in this case and 0 in this case. But it doesn't know which one is playing. All it gets is this fn thing and it, and it makes queries and it gets back answers. So when it's playing this game, it will sometimes output a 1, sometimes not. Outputting 1 is an event in this game or probability space and we can evaluate its probability. If we fix an adversary, having fixed the game already and having fixed f, we could come up with some number, 0 0.357, whatever, for this probability. We could do the same here, and we've seen examples of that. We've seen how we can write adversaries and, and decide what this probability is. These two adversaries are the same. We're looking at these for the same adversary. So we get these two numbers. Now, we don't actually care about their individual magnitudes. What we're interested in is how close are they? What the adversary is trying to do is output 1 here and 0 here. If it can do that, this value would be 1, this would be 0, and these would be very far apart. More generally, maybe it's wrong sometimes. So how close these values are is a metric of how well the adversary does, and that's called its advantage. We put the subscript f to indicate that we are measuring security of this family of functions, superscript prf to indicate this metric and then we define the advantage of a as the difference in the probability that it returns one in these two games over here. Okay and that's it this is the core main definition but one that we'll play with throughout not just this chapter but return to many many times over and again over again. So the advantage is just a metric the way we think about it is that what A is trying to do is maximize that advantage. It wants to make it as close to one as possible. The closer it can make it to one, the better A is doing, and the worse is our function f. Its intention is that outputting one is saying, I think I'm in the real world, and outputting zero is I think I'm in the random world. When the advantage of A is small, we think of that as meaning that A is doing poorly, and f is looking good, at least in the sense that it resists the attack A is mounting, although it might succumb to other attacks. Now one question that often comes up is that what if A, what if the advantage is negative? Just by convention, we'd regard that as also doing poorly. You will never really need to encounter such a case because whenever you have an adversary with a negative advantage, you can always kind of flip it around to get one with a positive advantage. So if you can avoid this ever really coming up. Okay, once we have our family of functions f, we are interested in how well adversaries do, what kind of advantages can they attain against this f. This will depend on a couple of things. One is what you may call strategy, how clever your adversary is, how well it exploits the structure of f to mount its attack, and so forth. But the other is brute force. What are its resources? How much computing time is it allowed? 
how many queries is it allowed to the FN oracle, and so forth. After all, you could always run an exhaustive key search attack, and that would be one way to try to violate PRF security. So, uh, and resources there would be correspondingly large. So, there isn't actually a firm dividing line between what's secure and what isn't, some kind of strict criterion that says this is secure and this isn't. Because exactly security depends on adversary resources. So roughly the way to think about it is that F is a secure PRF if this advantage is small for any adversary that uses a practical amount of resources. And that's what we're interested in. If your adversary's resources are restricted to amounts beyond which you don't think it can go in practice, and if that adversary doesn't do well, then this is good enough for usage. Cryptographers often quantify that with the metric of bit security. So for example, I might say, here's a block cipher or other object that has 80 bits of security. What that means is that if you consider an adversary whose running time is 2 to the 80, it might have advantage 1. If you consider an adversary of running time 2 to the 79, its advantage is at most a half. If the running time is 2 to the 78, the advantage is at most a quarter, and so on. Now, it's usually easier to think about insecurity than security, because to say F is insecure means that you can give an attack a specific algorithm or adversary A that is practical, it doesn't do much in resource utilization, and it gets a high advantage. Okay, so um, let's uh, exemplify this now, and we'll do that by taking a particular family of functions and trying to evaluate how well it does as a PRF. So. I'm going to define this family of functions. I pick some integer L, which will be both the key length and the block length. And I define it very simply, f on a given a key k and input x simply returns the xor of k and x. Okay, so that's a well-defined family of functions. And now my question is, is it a secure PRF or not? And this is the kind of question that you get also in your assessments. How do you start answering that? You remember what the games are, and you realize that what the question is saying is, can you think of an adversary that does well, that has a high advantage? So it's asking you to put on your attacker hat and use some ingenuity, examine this function family, and say, okay, can I write some pseudocode specifying an attacker, evaluate its success under this PRF metric to get a number its advantage, and this number will be high, close to 1, despite my adversary being low resource. And if that's the case, then you've shown it's not a PRF. And if you fail to do that, well, that's not proof it is a PRF because maybe there is an attack and you didn't find it, but it may be some evidence. A good starting point is that you do have to look at the games. It's very crucial to look at them. Let's rewrite them, but not in the generic way we had before. We'll rewrite them specialized to our situation here. That means that in the real game, we know that the key space is a set of L-bit strings, so the key is chosen from that. And here, where we have to evaluate f sub k of x, we know that it now does this. So we'll put that in here as the return value. This game is just a random one, and the only specialization is that we now know that this space is a set of L-bit strings, and we put that here. Okay, so now the question is, well, go ahead and try. Come up with some adversary. So how do you approach this? The first is you look at intuitively at this thing and say, look at this function family f. Does it have some sort of property or structure that makes it non-random? In other words, if I saw inputs and outputs all under the same key. I don't know the key, but I see the inputs and outputs. Is there something, some structure in them that would not be true if those outputs were purely random? And after a while you see there is a structure. Actually, there's lots of such structure, but here's one simple equation that's true. 
Suppose I evaluate this function in input 0 and then also on input 1. So I get k plus 0 the first time, k plus 1 the second time. Now suppose I XOR those two together, which I can do if I have those two output values. The k's go away and I'm left with 1. So the XOR of the function on two inputs is a constant. But no random function has that property. If you take a random function and XOR on two inputs, you will not get back one of those inputs. You'll get back some random thing. So this becomes our test. Now that's the intuitive part. The next step is to turn this into an attack, which means we have to write an adversary. And an adversary is always written as pseudocode. You may write this in your in Python in PlayCrypt. So remember that this adversary plays the games. So what it has access to is this fn oracle, and it can call that, and then it has to return a bit as an answer. Remember, it does not have access to the key k. If your adversary starts quoting or using this key k, it's going to be wrong because that just doesn't exist in its interface. The way we implement the attack is that our adversary goes to its box fn and says, please tell me the result on 0. It also goes to the box and says, please tell me the result on 1. It XORs them and it checks if the result is 1. Why is it doing this? Because it knows that in this game, by this equation, that will be true, the result will be 1. And it expects also that in this game it'll rarely be true. So if the condition holds, it says, I think I'm in the real world, I return 1, else I think I'm in the random world. That's it, that's our adversary, it's just one line of code. Okay, okay our task isn't still done because the next thing we need to do is just check that it works, and that means evaluate its advantage. Now once you're at this point, you kind of know that it's going to work. That's kind of how you got here. But we still need to figure out what that advantage is. So how do we get that? We look separately at each game and we evaluate the probability of the adversary with that game returning one. And then we subtract those two values and we have the advantage. So here I show you the adversary again, it's not changed, and the real game, and we ask, what is the probability of this adversary returning one in this game? Okay, so how do we determine that? Well, we see how the adversary works, and this tells us what is coming back in return to these queries. And we see that it is k plus the input, where k was whatever is chosen here. This will be k plus 0, this will be k plus 1, and um, we know now what happens. If this is f sub k of 0, this is f sub k of 1, we know the formula for each of them, add them up and you just get 1. And that's what the adversary here checks. So we conclude that this is, equation will always be true. So the probability of the adversary returning 1, meaning hitting this statement, is 1. That's always the case. Okay, we go to the second case. Our adversary is unchanged. Of course our function family is unchanged, but the game is changed. It has a procedure fn of the same name, but what it does is quite different. We return to evaluate how likely it is that playing this game, our adversary returns the bit 1. It again does the same things. It calls this on 0 and this on 1. But what is it that's returned? Well, in each case, just a random number. So you get like a random L-bit string and a random L-bit string and you're testing if the result adds up to 1. We've seen that problem before. If these two things are random L-bit strings, how likely is it that their XOR is some fixed value where it's just 1 into the L? The example we saw in prior slides was the case L equals 3, but it easily generalizes. So we get that this probability is 1 into the L. Thinking of L as big, it's awfully small. The advantage is then by definition the difference of these two probabilities, so 1 minus 2 to the minus L, and given that we think of L as quite big, this is alarmingly close to 1. Additionally, the adversary is extremely efficient. Two calls to Fn, one line of code, pretty much zero running time, and so our conclusion, this function failed rather badly to be a PRF. It was easily broken. 
Okay, so hopefully you can go back and do a weather example, make sure you see that it makes sense. And we'll see lots of such things. So here's um, another exercise you can play with, um, another example family of functions. And it's defined this time in terms of AES. And you might think, oh, well, AES is there, so that means it's going to be secure and hard to break. But this thing uses AES in a rather unconventional way, which is that it reverses the roles of the key and message. And that's allowed. It's just a function. These are both 128-bit strings. I can call it on what I like. But it changes the semantics enough that you will be able to give an attack violating PRF security with extremely high probability using only two queries to the oracle. Okay. So I leave you to play with that. And this is yet another exercise. This one plays with the internal structure of DES and asks you to evaluate PRF security of that. But while DES has 16 rounds, your question here will only pertain to either one or two rounds. Okay, so um, we now have a metric of security. So we have a way to measure um, how good a block cipher is. And that is, how well does it perform as a PRF? What advantage can an adversary get against PRF security as a function of its practical resources? So um, towards assessing how well block ciphers fare under this, we're going to get into something we call birthday attacks and the corresponding birthday problem. But in fact, the interest of that goes a lot beyond um, block ciphers. This will show up everywhere in cryptography, not just in attacks, but also in analyses, establishing security. And it's also just a nice, fun and basic um, probabilistic phenomenon. So the name comes from the rendition of the problem in which you have Q people. You think of them as having birthdays that are random and independent days of the year. So each birthday is a number from 1 to 365. And was chosen at random and independently of the others. Let's suppose all these people are gathered in a room and I'm interested in how likely is it that those among those Q people that exist two which have the same birthday. So this is called a birthday collision. I'll refer to that probability as C of 365 and Q, 365 because of that many days in the year, Q as the number of people in the room and C stands for collision. You can also think of the property as probability event as being that all the birthdays are not all different, right? It's the opposite of the event that they're all distinct from each other. So, um, well, what is the value of this probability and how large does it have to be, we may ask, before there's a sizable chance that there are actually two people in the room with the same birthday. So this is a kind of classic introductory probability question. And one reason for that is that if you don't have a um, experience with probability, one might estimate an answer um, which is a little like this. It says, well, there are 365 days in the year, so you have Q people. So you would expect that the chance of two of them having the same birthday is around Q divided by 365. If so, then Q has to be maybe around 50% of 365, which is, what, 180, around, to um, have a half chance of two people having the same birthday. But this turns out to be incorrect. And the actual answer is, is somewhat more surprising. What it says is that the probability of two people having the same birthday grows quadratically in the number of people in the room. So not Q over 365, but more like Q squared over 365. And this has a drastic impact on how quickly you reach a threshold under which it's quite likely that two people in the room have the same birthday. In particular, for a probability of one half that two people in the room have the same birthday, Q only has to be about the square root of 365 or around 23. And this can seem rather puzzling and paradoxical at first glance, which is why it's often called the birthday paradox. Even though there are 365 days in the year, you only need 23 people in a room to
to have a pretty good chance that two of them have the same birthday. Um, there's actually a formula for C of 365 in Q, and here are some values of it so you can see how that probability ramps up. So if you have 15 people in the room, you have about a 25% chance of two having the same birthday. 20 people, it climbs to 41%. 25 people, it's about 57%. Um, 30 people, 70%, so forth. 23 was the threshold at which it passes 50%. By the time you had 50 people in the room, there's a 97% chance that two people have the same birthday. Um, I've played this game in class at times, and uh, we go through the class and see how quickly we find a birthday collision, and it's usually very quick. I don't think we've ever failed to find one. There have been times we found one in the first few tries, but um, certainly within like 30 people, it's very rare to not have found it. So we can look at this um, on the internet, that can be interesting. So for example, you can easily pull up pages where you can calculate birthday probability. So over here, they will ask you uh, to give some parameters. So I can talk about the number of people sharing the same birthday. I put that to two. What that means is we're talking about collisions. You can ask a question of what's the probability that there are three people in the room with the same birthday. but that's a different question. So number of days in the year, well, they allow that to be a parameter since maybe you're from a planet which has a different number of days in the year. And then um, I used 40 as a number of people in the group. I click Calculate, and it says there's about a 0.89% uh, probably or 89% chance of a birthday collision with 40 people. Um, for People who are not that savvy about probability theory, rumor has it that this has been used um, as a kind of betting game to make money. So this web page discusses a, a gambler who apparently was called Amarillo Slim. And uh, he um, apparently went around and, you know, when he would find a room of people or a bar or whatever, and make bets about how likely it was that two people there had the same birthday. And since most people had a naive idea of how that grew with the number of people, and he would have, I guess, memorized the formulas and tables we've seen, um, he could win his bets, right? Because the math was in his favor, as this web page says. Um, and then what else? If I can pull it up. This is a discussion on a gambling website, because I guess they want to educate people about this or win by it or I don't know. Okay, so um, maybe another element worth clarifying before we go on to um, um, understanding it more mathematically. One of the reasons that this mistaken intuition occurs that the probability is something linear in the number of people divided by 365 is a confusion between two questions. One question I could ask is, how likely is it that someone in this room has the same birthday as me? That is not very likely. Even if I have 150 people in the room, it's probably less than half probability that someone has the same birthday as me. But that's not the question I'm asking. The question I'm asking is how likely is it that there exist some two people with the same birthday? And that is way more likely. Okay, so now in crypto, of course, it's not the n equal 365 that we're interested in. We're interested in the general version of this problem. For us, we'll imagine a planet in which it takes, uh, you know, two to the 64 days to go around the sun or whatever. So we'll be interested in rather large values of n. But having fixed some parameter n, the general birthday problem picks q points at random in the range 1 through n, and then considers the probability that they're not all distinct. And that's called the collision probability c of n and q. It's a function of both n and q. You will see this thing turn up in lots of places. So it's worth remembering 
that C of n in Q is defined as this collision probability. And the birthday setting is simply the case where n is 365. Okay, the fact to remember is that roughly speaking, C of n in Q grows quadratically in Q and inversely in n. So roughly speaking, it's about Q squared divided by 2n. Now that only holds within some ranges of the parameters, but we're almost always within those ranges, so um, it's a good rule of thumb. When we want to make precise computations of the form that were used to create that table that I had a few slides back, we can in fact compute a mathematical formula for the value of this probability, and maybe it's instructive to see how that's done because it gives us some intuition about why the value is as it is. Uh, so let's try to do it. So again, we are picking Q points Y1 through YQ independently at random from this from a set of size N. Rather than directly compute C, I'll compute the probability of the complement event. The complement event is that the Ys are all distinct. None of them, no two of them are the same. So the probability of that by definition is one minus the collision probability. So now let's try to figure this out. The way we think about it is what's called the game of throwing balls in bins. Imagine there are n bins lined up and you have q balls and you keep tossing these balls into the bins. And as you toss them, there may or may not be a case where one ball lands on top of the other so that a bin has two balls in it. When that happens, it's called a collision. We're trying to figure out here the probability that we avoid collisions. Let's do it ball by ball. I throw in the first ball. What is the probability that I avoid a collision, that there's no collision created by the first ball? Well, it's one. There was no other ball to collide with anywhere. No matter where it lands, there's not a collision. But now that first ball occupies some position, say it's there in bin number 208. I throw in the second ball. How likely am I to avoid a collision? That'll happen as long as I fall in any bin except bin 208, which is occupied. There's one bin leading to a collision, n minus one avoiding it. So my probability of avoiding a collision is n minus one over n. I multiply those probabilities because the balls are chosen independently. And so it goes on. Now there's two occupied bins. For all but those two positions, I avoid a collision when I throw in the third ball, and so on up to throwing in Q balls. And so I get this formula here for um, the value of one minus the collision probability, and I solve for the collision probability and it looks like this. Now this formula is fine for creating tables and such because I can write some code and plug in the numbers and it'll crank out the value. But it's actually not obvious from this that it grows quadratically in Q and inversely in N. So for that, we use estimates. There isn't actually a precise formula of that form, but we can say that the collision probability is to within a small constant Q squared over N. And to be more precise, this fact gives lower and upper bounds on it. The upper bound is 50% of Q into Q minus one over N, the lower bound is 30% of that. So it's somewhere in, in that range. A technical caveat, these bounds only hold as long as Q lies uh, below about the square root of N. That's sensible because if you look at the lower bound, above that, this number will be more than one. And the probability can't be more than one. It wouldn't even make sense. The point is that once you hit around this much, you effectively, are, this is effectively becoming one and it's no longer interesting to go beyond that. Okay, so these are estimates you can use as you, as you go on. 